You're watching Life in the Law. I'm Marianne Sasaki. You can see us on Wednesdays between 1 and 1.30 every week where we discuss uh, hot legal and political issues as we are going to this week with my favorite guest, hands down, Jay Fidel. Welcome, Jay. Hi, Marianne. You're the, uh, you know how much I, I love what, having you as a guest. Um, and today we're going to talk about what the we're going to talk about Russia and Donald Trump, but in a larger sense, the great uh, unraveling of, of America, I, I don't know, Amer America, the nightmare of American politics. I mean, I think it's starting to dawn on people now, right? That Well, you know, all things considered, um, try to put all political biases aside, mm -hmm. um, do you think that Russia has our best interests in mind? No. I... They said they they set him up. I mean, that's what they did. They set him up as a patsy, and they probably played to his weakest suit, which is his ego. And so, that's why he thinks Putin is such a, a great man, such a great leader, because people treat Putin like he's a, well, like he's a dictator, because he's sort of what he is, a dictator, right? So the Russians understood something about Trump. Maybe they understood something about Trump we didn't even understand about Trump. The way to manipulate him is through his ego. Yeah, well, I think they do have dossiers on people, and I, I'm convinced they have a dossier on Trump, and the dossier first examines who he is and what he's like and what his right. foibles are, and then, of course, uh, they try to get dirt on him right. so they can manipulate him in a larger sense. But he said he wasn't involved, his business wasn't deeply involved in Russian business, and the dossier says that, they, that he is enmeshed in Rus Russian businesses. And, and, well, this is something we were talking about earlier. Um, how do you deal with a president who just is not straight with you, who just doesn't tell you the truth and stands by it, doesn't really bother him that it's, he conf says conflicting sentences? And Before I answer that, I'd like to tell you there are a lot of people out there, including here in Hawaii. What did I read? Some 30 percent of the people in Hawaii, the electorate actually, who voted, voted for him. That's really amazing. Um, there are a lot of people that you and I know who believe him. They do not come to the conclusion that he is lying. But they, he says they go to great things lengths that are to believe him. You know, opposite each other. Like, you know, we're going to build a wall. Mexico is going to pay for it. Now Mexico says they're not going to pay for it, and he's going. He says we're going to make Mexico pay for it. it. I don't know. He just he he makes these wild assertions. Uh, I'm with you. I mean, I agree that he hasn't been telling us the truth during this campaign, and that's a lot of time, right. too much time. Um, but there are people who believe him and find a way to rationalize the way he rationalizes all these inconsistencies. Jay, we elected a billionaire. We elected the first billionaire to be president of the United States. He didn't even give the public his tax returns. Every other president had. Every other presidential candidate had. Well, there's had. a new theory about that. What's the you new know, theory? I mean, Hillary's theory was that um, if you looked at his tax returns, you'd find, uh, oh, I forget what it was. That he, he had really didn't make any money. He had so many deductions that he that, didn't pay any taxes. That was her taxes. theory, and, and she had other theories too. But the theory that she didn't have, which is now only surfacing, is that he had a lot of business income coming out of Russia. Right. And, of course, the Russian government has something to say about that. And I think it was his son who spoke in 2008 and said that there was a very substantial amount uh, if not a plurality of the income that he was receiving was coming from Russia. So uh, I think the theory that's been discussed in the media, um, and boy, it's hard to not hear it, you know, I mean, and, and it's hard not to believe it, actually, um, is the theory is that, um, that he doesn't want to reveal his tax returns because it will reveal his connections with Russia, right. which are formidable right. uh, and have been going on a long time and explain his strange relationship with Putin uh, and some of the statements that he's made right. lately. And even, you know, frankly, his choice of Rex Tillerson. I mean, I, I think there's no uh, bigger businessman that's a bigger friend of Russia than Rex Tillerson. He, you know, I, I was watching his confirmation hearings, and he's had, he's had relationships with so many countries that we've sanctioned over the years. He just doesn't seem to be playing by American, like, rules. He's above... He's above the countries, right? He's playing on some other it's a multinational, geopolitical, multinational yeah, right, level. See themselves as above countries. Right. They they avoid tax in one country by going to another country, which is interesting because then Trump would give him a tax break, even though he really doesn't need a tax break. Um, and and in fact, what I heard recently is that 
Tillerson received some kind of People's Medal in Russia. From he Putin. did, from Putin, yeah, yeah he did. Yeah, for some kind like of joint operation. Like the best friend of Russia, did. like a very friend dear of friend Russia, of Russia. Yeah. For, for some joint project they did uh, in, in, in fossil fuels. Right. Uh, where they partnered in extracting fossil fuels, and that helped Exxon and it helped Russia. Well, there's plenty of footage of him and Putin sort of yucking it up and talking convivially with each other yeah. and... Yeah. and uh, you know, considering the revelations uh, of yesterday and this morning, and um, that the uh, the intelligence agencies thought that it was so significant that they they gave it to both the president and the president elect in the daily briefing report. I mean, that kind of stuff doesn't happen. We think Russia has sunk its tentacles into Donald Trump and has been doing so for many years and has a lot of information. Some of it pornographic or dirty, or some of it just dirty business, and uh, they could they could control our president by virtue of this information. Well, it's data. coming out that way. Of course, uh, th let's talk about BuzzFeed. Let's talk about the memo from MI5. Right. You know, why don't you discuss that? Well, the memo from MI5, which I just perused briefly, um, indicated that... It's in BuzzFeed, by the way. BuzzFeed. If you want to read the memo, um, go to BuzzFeed.com. They're the only pub, the only media that had the chutzpah to actually publish it. Everybody else said, oh, it hasn't been verified and qualified, uh, so they didn't publish it, not yet anyway. Uh, but BuzzFeed had the chutzpah. Well, e the, I w the only qualifying thing I would say is that I understand that the genesis of this memorandum was counter, um, uh, counter operations um, in the Republican Party itself, like somebody in the Republican Party commissioned some kind of report and somehow MI5 got a hold of the information that they had been commissioning. But anyway, so the, the, the upshot is that for, for the past five years, Russia has been compiling a secret dossier on, on Donald Trump. And in it, it, it has his business dealings within Russia. It has certain, um, certain uh, meetings he's had, um, uh, promises he's made, um, he, he, certain sexual, you know, uh, embarrassing sexual information. And um, it's very difficult. By the way, those could easily have been Russian provocations. Well, that's what that I was going to say. Standard There's a Russian word for that. It's Russia called like Matsakara, disinformation. Well, but standard operating procedures to provide a girl uh, who somehow subverts you in a hotel room and somebody's, somebody has a camera taking pictures and now it's in the dossier. Right. It didn't right. happen by accident. Right. It was not an afterthought, it was right. a forethought. Oh, okay. That's what happens that's... in Russia. Well, that's, that's the country that uh, Donald Trump uh, is enmeshed in. The, his business dealings are enmeshed in that country. And moreover, he's still going to have connections with his those businesses because this morning in his press conference, he said he was turning over the reins of the business to his two sons. And he said, just like Rex Tillerson said, he never discussed Russia with, with the president-elect. The president-elect said he's never going to discuss his businesses with his two sons, ever. All right, but let me add to, to maintain that they, a, a up till firewall. now they discuss those businesses every day. I would imagine. They I, work together yeah, on a very right. close basis exactly. every day. So all I, of a sudden, there's a sort of Chinese wall there. Yeah saying, oh, no, we can't discuss that. So don't talk to me about it. Right. Can you, can you believe that? I, don't, no, I can't I believe that. I don't believe that. it. Yeah. I don't believe it. And I don't believe the American public, well, he had a lawyer on. Did you see the lawyer speaking uh, for uh, like a, a, probably 10 minutes sort of um, uh, defending him and uh, saying why it wasn't a violation of the em emoluments clause, which is taking um, benefits. Yeah. And... Um, Apparently, they think the presidency is is apart from any other agency. In any other agency, you can't you can't have uh, personal dealings outside with to your benefit outside of your agency. You can't hire uh, relatives, for example. But but the, the presidency, there's no. Um, so uh, explicit language. It's not an agency. Yeah, it's the, right. the law says... Right, there's uh, no explicit language that it's an agency, even though it's treated agency, like an agency. But, but they're saying this is all one, one place. But the it's agencies the are House. part of the executive branch. It's so I, I don't agency. see how, you know, it, if you've ever studied administrative law, you know that agencies are part of the executive branch. They don't fit in with Congress. It's a Congress. cute interpretation. 
Yeah. But there are those who, 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 who believe that. There are lawyers who believe that. Oh, yeah, there was this lawyer uh, what today. Trump, what Trump pretends to do here does not violate the emoluments. Right, right, provision. right. But I do not see why people aren't shaking their fists and asking more questions and wanting more information. I, like, I mean, how could they believe that he's, he, he's not going to be involved in this business that he built with his sons over time? I mean, he's clearly not engaged in global politics in the way that President Obama was. He doesn't understand the nuances of global politics, nor does he understand the nuances of domestic politics. So he only understands business. I mean, that's, that's the only thing I've ever really seen him address. Have you ever seen him address really uh, domestic problems, that, solutions to domestic problems other than we're going to overturn Obamacare? No, but no. nobody has, doesn't no, have a solution. I think he's lived in a very narrow world of his own making. I mean, what's interesting here, to take it from that point of view, is that you know you have geopolitics, you have politics, you have diplomacy. That's one world, and then you have business. Yeah, that's another world. Total Multinational world. corporations like Tillerson, and that's a different world. I have to think now. We we have to distinguish those two worlds. So you can be you know knowledgeable about one, but doesn't necessarily mean you're knowledgeable about the other. But but. Trump sold the American public on the idea that the country is a big business and it needs a big businessman to run it. I mean, but it isn't. Governing is not like business. Governing has, it's, it has a more elevated purpose than business. But, well, it's, business, it's, a, but it's a seductive argument, isn't it? You know, I, yeah, know I know business. I've been successful at business. I can deal with these people. I have the negotiating skills to go out and deal with any country. Right. And frankly, what the diplomacy needs is more candid negotiating skills, and I can deliver that. And, and I think a lot of people bought that. Well, I don't but know. But I think that proof is, will be in the pudding, I and that's coming I think with Rex Tillerson soon. particularly, because he was willing to violate um, U.S. sanctions by going through other countries who did not have sanctions, like he did business with Iran. So uh, I don't know how he's going to negotiate with Iran, who is, could be the it's, the, it's the sort of, wild card in the Middle East, right? Every, it's a huge country, very powerful. We never quite know, quite have them under control. We have a numerous uh, uh, dip diplomatic attempts at keeping them under control. And uh, I don't see how Rex Tillerson can just go, go what is he going to go in and shake the hands of the, you know, the Maybe head? Maybe so. Maybe he'll rely on those old relationships and try to approach this on a business basis and bypass what he considers the irrelevance of uh, diplomacy. Um, but I, you know, I, I don't think that's going to work. Let's look at Russia for a minute, though. You wanted to talk about Russia. Okay. That's why you wore the red, red dress. I yeah. Think. yeah. Well, um, we, uh, well, well, why don't we take a quick break and then we can talk about it at length. Let's talk about your red dress during the break. Don't, let's not talk about my red dress. We'll, we'll be back in a minute. Hi, I'm Chris Leatham with The Economy and You, and I'd like to invite you each week to come watch my show each Wednesday at 3 p.m. Thank you for watching Think Tech. I'm Grace Chang, the new host for Global Connections. You can find me here live every Thursday at 1 p.m., where we'll be talking to people around the islands or visiting the islands who are connected in various aspects of global affairs. So please tune in, and aloha, and thanks for watching. Aloha, I'm Reg Baker, the host of Business in Hawaii, that broadcasts live every Thursday from 2 to 2.30. Today we were very fortunate enough to have a Dr. Miller and her service dog, Muffin. Uh, we talked about the ADA and we covered some of the different do's and don'ts of having service dogs in your establishment uh, and how to sniff out the fakes. Please uh, tune in for Business in Hawaii on Thursday to find out all about service dogs. Aloha. Hi, I'm Marianne Sasaki, and we're discussing Russia with Jay Fidel. Jay's convinced I'm wearing a red dress in solidarity, but I'm not. I just like the color red, and it's festive. Um, so we were talking about uh, Putin, and what, what drives Putin, and what's going on in Russia? What's, what, what's happening? I mean, they're not a world power anymore. You can't say they're a world power. And they're not, for that matter, a successful economic power no. either. 
but it reminds me of Germany after World War I. Um, they were put down, they, they lost face, you know, in World right. War I, and likewise in, in the loss of the Soviet Union. They right. lost face. And um, I think Putin's biggest calling card domestically with his own people is to say, I'll, I'll give you face. I'll make Russia a world power again. Um, you know, I'll make Russia great again. Yeah. It's right, a, it's a sense there's it's a, a parody there, right? Yeah, but he's doing it. And, and how is he doing it? He's doing it ge geopolitically. Right. Um, you know, when, when he goes in and takes over, uh, uh, you know, Russian-speaking areas in, in, uh, in Odessa, mm -hmm. um, he's making the people in Russia feel like this is the good old days. Right. When he does that in Ukraine, making them feel like good old days. USSR, and, right. And then he, you know, uh, sort of takes pieces out of the NATO countries and the Baltics now, which he's doing it, and they're afraid. And he's attacking them with cyber terrorism on they a regular should, basis. They should be afraid. They should be he's, afraid. He's acquisitive. Yeah. He's, it is a lot like World War um, Germany after World War One, sort of bite by bite, taking uh, uh, countries that are sort of vulnerable, ne near you and vulnerable, right? So and, and and making people in Russia feel that they can achieve the same level of togetherness of global power that uh, they had before, and this this drives, I think, a country. It makes. In any event, it makes him more powerful. Makes him more powerful. I, I don't know how much the average Russian really yearns for the good old days of a united uh, U USSR, he's got no, United Soviet Republic. He's got Socialist no Republic. contender. There's nobody who stands up to him. There's no rival. But he kills people. I mean, well, he kills his enemies. So I mean, yes, that could does. be a, that could be a reason. He kills journalists who disagree with him. Yes. Remember that guy in London? Yeah. Oh, that was awful. It, it was awful. Radioactive cocktail. Right. Oh, that was awful. It was like, like something and, and out of a spy novel. Everybody knows it's, it's him. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows. And, and, and everybody knows that what Putin reports as his income from, from his you know, job uh, is not his real income. He's one of the wealthiest men in the world. He, I'm sure. He's, so. he, I'm sure he has uh, very close uh, relationships with all of the Russian oligarchs. I yeah. mean, how could they operate if they didn't operate? He in makes tandem? them, they make him. Right, it's exactly. You, it's sort of like Tillerson and, and yes, Trump. Yes, it is. You know, I had the same <laughs> thought. You know, he, he has these relationships with the oligarchs. He has relationships with the big boys, with Tillerson and with Trump. It's the big boys club. Right. It's it the is. billionaires. It's, it's not, being a millionaire is not enough anymore. You have to have billions and billions of dollars so that nobody could really realistically make that sort of money during their lifetime. So it was a very smart thing for him to do to respond to Obama's uh, sanctions by imposing no sanctions. That was clever. Trump was right to say that was clever. Right. Um, he's a very clever guy. Oh, he's clever. Putin. I wouldn't say that he's uh, not. The question is whether he's more clever than Trump is. And I think my answer is yes. I think so. I think so. I think so. I think you know you grew up in Russia, um, particularly as the, as the country is falling apart. I think I don't know if clever. Uh, I definitely think there's a certain survival instinct. I have a friend that lives in Russia, and and he never tires of telling stories about you know the survival instinct of the uh, of Russians, of in individual Russians, and the lengths they will go to prevail. And um, I think it's something we may not even understand here, but uh, I I think that he would that Putin will go to any lengths to prevail, any at all. Right. I don't know that Trump would. Including but I really think, dastardly acts. Yeah, exactly. I yeah. think. Trump, in a sense, is a little bit um, naive when it comes to Putin. Well, you know, I think part of Putin's agenda is not only to aggrandize his own position and Russia's power or refound, re rediscovered power, but also to make the U.S. look bad. I mean, both of those things happening at the same time. Right. And he has effectively done that in Syria, don't you think? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. He, he, he stepped in when we did and... and He's in control now of the situation. Yeah, and I mean, I read recently that uh, we had we had planes flying up there, uh, apparently contending or competing with uh, the Russian fighter jets. Right. Ooh, that's really eerie. That it's there's a possibility of, of an incident any second. You uh, know, I have to tell you, I think it's much eerier for people like us than I think there's a whole generation that just didn't didn't grow up with the, you know, the threat of Russia, you know, the omnipresent threat of n nuclear uh, war with Russia. Duck and, and cover. Yeah, duck, duck and, and cover. cover. That's yeah. right. And I think that they may not understand 
uh, the significance of a country having an arsenal of nuclear weapons and a bone to pick. You know, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a deadly, deadly on the precipice situation. And we knew it. We lived with it every day in the 60s, mid-70s maybe. When did that go away? But with Reagan, I mean, it went away. It can be really mean. I mean, we had a moment of light with uh, um, Yeltsin. And, mm -hmm. um, who's Gorbachev. That? Gorbachev mm -hmm. after him. In fact, the Clintons were friendly. With, Gorbachev uh, was a, 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 I think, a brilliant leader of the 20th century. I mean, yeah. he, was, he tried to do and the Yeltsin right thing. Yeltsin was an alcoholic. Yeah. Sorry. Part There's a story was. about how he was actually um, a house guest at the White House in, in the Clinton years, and he got drunk and went out in the street looking for a pizza parlor, <laughs> and wandering down yeah. the street drunk looking for a pizza parlor. They, they found him and brought him that's back. That's so funny. <laughs> that's really well, funny. Well, let's talk about cyber terrorism because that's part of Yeltsin's M.O. here. I mean, he's, he says that, um, what, what was the was great comment? War is peace without the blood, and peace I got it backward. But war and peace are the same. You're always at war, even in peacetime. Peace is war without the blood. Peace is war without the blood. But it's, a, it's always that competition. It's always that aggressive motivation. And cyber war fits right in. You know, there, was a, there have been several articles about his efforts these days, right now, to achieve a huge army bigger than the cyber war you know, uh, a part of the, the Pentagon. Right. A huge army of cyber cyber warriors and terrorists and the like, um, and he gets them from the students, from the schools. He gets them from the industry, uh, and he gets them from the criminals in jail. And he puts them all together. They're all around the country, all you know, coordinated in order to do cyber terrorism. It's kind of extraordinary because so you have a country that doesn't really have the power it used to have. How do you make it influential? In, you know, an in influential power. C cyber terrorism is perfect. You I bring mean, the other guy yeah, down. Exactly. That's what you do. Exactly. You have a cadre of guerrilla, basically guerrilla fighters, but they're fighting on the in online and through the internet or however they they do it, and uh, you can cause a lot more damage than your you know relatively disempowered country can uh, cause by if they invaded a, a big country. So know? we are now in a war, I think. And it's a war of deterrence. It's a war where we know he can do bad things. He knows we can do bad things. Who's to say which one is better? Frankly, I think he's better right now. Um, and so nobody does really drastic things. But that could happen any time. Right, proportional response. Yeah, but, but proportional response, I mean, that's sort of a stopgap measure, right? I mean... No, I, I think, but you have to you have to build that whole thing about cyber war in to look at what Putin really is and what he's after. It's not defensive what he's doing. Oh, yeah. It's aggressive. It's what aggressive. He's doing. Yeah, absolutely. And getting dossiers on American politicians and uh, hacking, having his people had no question that happened in my mind. No, no, uh, there is the FBI says it happened. Yeah, right. Hacking uh, Clinton and then using it but and why manipulating would, an why election. Would Donald Trump it's very aggressive deny, stuff. Deny, deny, deny that aggression. Because, because Putin has something on him. That's my, that's my. Opinion. You really think so? He yeah. actually has a, a genuine. Yeah. Yeah, I think Putin could have brought him down, but Putin wanted him to be in this office because he felt. Putin felt that, um, that, that he had a friend in, or could have a friend in Trump. Right. And right. so it builds his power. Well, Trump has been acting like a friend. That he, he won't, you know, he won't denounce the... One of the things he said recently was, uh, there's no reason why we can't be friendly with Russia. Right. I am going to forge a new relationship with Russia, and you're really going to like it. Right. Really? Do you think so? Do right. you think that's possible? Yeah. Russia, I mean, such an, such, so great, you're right, so aggressive, such an aggress, uh, you know, aggressor. Um, but I think a lot of people, maybe, don't, citizens don't understand the nature of the aggression and how powerful it is. I mean, they, there's no boys going to, to, you know, there's no physical manifestation of cyber war or fair, right? right? So they don't understand. It's, it's very esoteric, right? And so this, they did something with, do they Hillary Clinton? Do they harm her chances in some way? But you know they did it very programmatically. You know leaked information about Hillary Clinton in a very programmatic or you know organized way, and they you know 
Yeah. Now, the other thing that uh, Putin general. is doing is he's trying to forge a new relationship with China. Back when, in the days of the Soviet Union and communism, there was, uh, you know, a, quite a relationship between Russia and China. I mean, I, you know, I, I think it was uncomfortable in some ways, but they were aligned in a some synergy, ways. yeah, a certain synergy. Okay, and, and I think Putin is trying to bring that back. And I think there are, you know, new, new connections between Russia and China right now. And Xi Jinping is probably happy with that because he's not happy with you know who. Yes, I agree with that. I, I couldn't agree with that more. But I, I'd say, for, with respect to Putin, he better tread very lightly in his relationships with China because the, if there is going to be somebody who will emerge as a world dominating force, uh, my money's on China. So, you know, uh, he, he won't be able to manipulate China the way he's oh, has agree. been agree. Donald that Trump. China's at the top of the heap oh, when absolutely. you're talking about uh, acumen in uh, geopolitical absolutely. maneuvers. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and they're in the Taiwan Straits now. They put their carrier, the one carrier in the Taiwan Straits, which is a direct response to that telephone call from Taiwan. Right, right. Um, so... They're very a, clear about their objectives. They, they, they're not... Um, they're not obsc uh, obscure about their rejection. If, if, when they're disturbed, they respond. Right. We woke, he woke. Yeah, he the woke sleeping, them up. The sleeping That's right. tiger. Right. Here. And even sometimes when they're not disturbed, they, they, well, they sink a battleship. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, the most significant thing about China now, in, in my mind, I'm, and I'm kind of looking at this from a business point of view, they put the railroad in. You know, the railroad that goes from Beijing to Western Europe, mm -hmm. one track mm -hmm. all the way. It makes Dr. Zhivago look light. This is, this is a serious freight railroad line all the way across the continent there, following the Silk Road. Maybe parts of it are in Russia. Right. And they are going to deliver manufactured goods all over Europe now. So that's At, total control. That's total it's control. economic, yeah. tremendous economic leverage. Well, it's what happened to the United States. It's what decimated uh, uh, American jobs, right? Jay, we're coming to our time. I hate that. I know. I want to go on, Mary. I know, on and on. Yeah. But it's been a wonderful conversation. I appreciate your helping and coming on in. And you're watching Life in the Law. I'm Marianne Saki. Tune in, think Tech, Wednesdays, 1 to 1.30.